Hey everyone, this is Brian Ferguson. Fans of the AWA, you are in for a real treat. My friend, Joyce Postion, has just released her book titled, My Ringside Seat to the AWA. Joyce writes about her personal experiences with wrestlers such as Nick Bockwinkle, Lord Alfred Hayes, Baron Von Raschke, and others. Joyce also has published many photos from her collection that you will not see anywhere else. Order today by email at joyce.postion at gmail.com. Payment is through PayPal. The book is only $20 plus $6 shipping and handling. International orders, please email Joyce for shipping charge. Folks, run. Don't walk to your keyboard and order today. And enjoy the podcast. Welcome to another edition of Pumps and Pumps, the talk of wrestling. I'm Brian Ferguson. My guest today really does not need an introduction. He has been a star of pro wrestling from the 1970s through the late 90s. He has been a member of the Fabulous Ones. He was known as Gator and even Doink the Clown. And I have my partner in crime today. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me introduce Mr. Steve Kern and... Welcome back, Mr. George Shire. Steve, thanks hey, for coming how you on doing? today. Well, Brian, and I thanks to for also having me on. You bet, you bet. I wanted to also mention your book, Kern Chronicles, Volume 1, The Fabulous Life of Steve Kern. There it is. There it is. There now, it is. Before, on, there it is. On Amazon. <laughs> Mine's on order. Mine's on order yeah. as I speak to you. I, want you I to hope you enjoy it. Oh, I, I know I will. I, I followed you career your career, Steve, from... 72 73 when you that's that's when you were breaking in the business and, okay uh, down, well i appreciate it and i don't know i think we're the same age you and i how old are you 72 born in september 51 okay okay um now you're a lot older than me george <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> no i was born 1951 in september also i am 72 what uh, what day in September? Let's get the really weird here. We're on. Me and Don Morocco have the same day. It's the tenth. Okay, seventeenth. Okay. Well, I'm, well, older, I'm older than you. You're older than me. Yeah, I sure am. My gram was my gram was on the twenty second, and all oh, the wow. way through all the way through high school and and, and through the, our whole lives, he would always call me on my birthday and say, "What's going on, old man?" Heck, you know, I'm, I'm only 12 days older than you, Mike. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, age never really affected me. I don't know. I still, it's kind of weird when you when you grow older because that, you know, I still look through the eyes of a 20 year old sometimes, or a yeah. 30 yeah. or 40 or whatever, yeah. Yeah. until yeah. I go by a mirror and I go, holy crap, yeah. who's that who old they, guy? <laughs> who the hell is that in there? Yeah. <laughs> Or sometimes just getting out of bed in the morning and realizing that you got to yeah. do it in sections to make sure everything's put together. Yeah, I just roll yeah. out just to hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, if we could. Uh, yes, sir. We were talking a story a minute ago before your action figure here from the AWA uh -huh, yeah. with Stan. And I we'd love to hear that story again about when you were in the toy store. Talk to us about that if you would. Oh, okay. Well, it was really weird because it, nobody had ever had action figures. I mean, you know, so far as in the wrestling industry and we were in the AWA and, you know, they, they approached us, Vern did and everybody. And then we did, we met with an artist and all this stuff. And then when they came out, I went to Toys R Us. And when I went into Toys R Us, they had this huge display, right? And I, I go up and it was a big rack and it had all the fabulous ones, the road warriors, um, some other jabroni tag teams, but these two I remember. <laughs> and I reached, I reached behind them and I scooped all the fabulous ones out and I put them in a basket. I was so excited, man. I was like a little kid. I mean, yeah. I was only 30 and at 72, that is a little kid, but I'm going <laughs> like, oh my gosh. And I couldn't wait. I got up to the counter and I started putting them on the counter and the guy looks at me, right? And he gives me this dead look kind of a Minneapolis look. He gave me this dead ass look and he says, oh, you must be a big wrestling fan, huh? And I'm going, oh, no, boy. that's me, man. And he's just looked at me and he looked at the doll and he goes, no way. 
And I'm going, wait a minute. And I pulled my driver's license out. And I said, read that name. And he goes, well, spell the same way must must be your name. I said, that's me. What do you think I'm buying all these? <laughs> Lo and behold, here's the deal now. What, however long ago that was, 84, so 40 years, somewhere yeah, in that, man. somewhere in there. Yeah. I, when, I, when I bought them, I think they were like three ninety five or four ninety five a piece, and now I've Ooh. seen them on I've seen them on eBay as high as yeah. fifteen hundred dollars, and that's not even signed. Yeah. I have I have in my collection. I kept everything I was ever a part of, every program, every wrestling yeah. magazine. I, I kept love it hearing all. that. I kept it all. I'm going to take it a step farther, and a lot of people are going to steal this from me. But I kept all that stuff, and what I did was I kept five of them that were not open. I mean, you know, I had I had them little action figures all over the house. Me and Stan had them in the car. We'd take wow. the Road Warriors, tie our bootlace to them, and throw them out the window, drag them <laughs> back in. Oh, and then right. I, I'd, I'd cover both of them on the dash, and Stan <laughs> would count them out. I mean, we punished Hawk and Animal. I mean, you know, with those little figures. But but what I was going to say is keeping all that stuff, most people would have never thought to keep the unopened packages because yeah. Collect yeah. that collecting wasn't a thing of that era. Yeah. Well, this is another thing that happened to me, and this is what the, everybody's going to steal that watches a show that's in the wrestling business. And I, and I encourage them to do this. But Mike Graham's daughter approached me after he had died. And there's nobody left. Mike's son uh, committed suicide. His dad committed suicide. His grandfather committed suicide. And Mike committed suicide. His daughter, Nicole, the only surviving family, the Gossett's uh, wrestling name, Graham, comes to me like I'm like an uncle to her. And I'm the only mm -hmm. kind of that connection in the wrestling business. And she says, Steve, what do I do with all of this stuff from my dad and my grandpa? I've uh. got... I've got so much stuff that they collected over the years. And I said, Nicole, let me just ask you to go through the stuff and see if they signed anything. Did they sign any of it? Mm -hmm. Because a picture is just a picture. If it's not autographed with authenticity, yeah. it's just another picture. It can be reproduced. So what I did was a big light bulb went off in my head. Well, not that big, but a big enough one. I pulled, I, we don't have anything in our house that represents wrestling. Everything that I have that kind of resembles wrestling is in the garage, including pictures on the wall and stuff, but nothing in the house. But I went out in the garage and I brought all this stuff in the house. And I have these big um, plastic containers with all these magazines and pictures and Japan stuff and every territory thing and program and I signed everything I have. As a matter of fact, if you look through the book when you get it and you see pictures of them, you're gonna see where I've signed it when they reproduce the picture in the book. Right. And, it, right. and it, it's, it's a question, of, why do you sign that picture? The reason I signed it, hey, I'm not gonna be around forever. And anything mm -hmm. that I have is that has zero value, but now, even if it's just a little bit of a boost and any of my kids or grandkids want to, you know, get rid of some of the stuff, at least it's autographed. Since, yeah. I, since I started that, whenever I do a wrestling con or an autograph signing or whatever, and any of my friends are there or sitting beside me or whatever, I sit and I tell them the story. And yeah. every, every one of them kind of looks at me and goes, you know what? That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah and, really and, I'm going, and, and I'm going, you know, I would have never thought of it if it hadn't been for Mike's Graham's daughter saying, what's my dad's stuff worth? And I said, yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, you know, so. Yeah. Well, wow. the thing is, it, it still has some value is that, you know, anything that's old programs, photos, et cetera. I mean, I can tell you that, but you, you nailed it. If it's autographed, I mean, that definitely, if someone is collecting, that adds to the value. It just literally does. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. time I go to see Stan, if I find something in my collection that he hasn't signed, 
Yeah. I put it, I put it in a suitcase and say, Hey, you need to sign these things. <laughs> you know, <Sure>. he's had <laughs> open yeah. heart surgery. You never oh, wow. know where your partner's Stan, going. <laughs> Stan has. Yes. Oh, wow. that's, that's too bad. Yeah. He's doing yeah. fine though. I hope. No, no, he's in no. great. He's in great health. I was just at an autograph great. thing with him and Tom Good Pritchard deal. on Saturday and okay. he's in great health. He just doesn't like to fly. So you have to do some, if you're going to do something with him, it has to be within driving range of Greensboro. Sure. So yeah. that, that's what the yeah. deal is. You know, since you mentioned Stan, you know, I really liked you guys as a team. I mean, I thought you were great. Oh, thanks. The, thanks. The whole, the whole shtick was new to me with the videos and stuff, but I really, because I'm a tag team lover since I was yeah. a kid. I love right. tag teams because there's so many stories that can be told in a tag team. And, um, one of the things that was weird when you guys came in, I had made trips down to Florida uh, several times in the late seventies, the very early eighties. And I remember one of the first matches that I saw at the Fort Hesterly Armory was uh, Stan Lane and Brian St. John. And the, the night I saw him, I didn't know if they were heels or babies and that, you know, that was before you guys, but right. there was one match where you, were teamed trying to think you were teamed with Mike Graham and you went against Stan Lane and Brian St. John in one of the <laughs> matches I saw. And then when I saw you come in as Stan's partner, I thought, this is cool. I saw these guys wrestle against each other, you know, and it was yeah, Stan, Stan, Stan was brand new in the business when he came to Florida. Yeah. You know, he got Ric Flair helped him get in. Rick Flair, he met Ric Flair at the beach where he was a bouncer. And, um, you know, anyway, he came into Florida and they teamed him up with Brian St. John and Mike Graham and I were partners. Um, and the education was in, in our industry, it's pretty simple. I mean, the veteran, whoever's got the most time and the most matches and the most experience controls everything. Right. Most of the most of, and most of the time in territorial days, the heels called the matches and the yeah. baby faces followed. But it, but when it come down to Stan and I wrestling against each other, I was calling the match. And one of the yeah. funniest stories was, and he just brought it up this weekend, telling Tom Pritchard as he said, "Yeah, the first time I wrestled Steve, he backed me in the ropes in Miami, and he goes one two. Well, a one two is where I hit you and you hit me back." Well, Stan hit me twice. He goes, one, two. Oh. Go, uh. <laughs> so, so I answered that, well, three then. And I, I won't say the <laughs> language I used with that. But then I said, well, three then. And I went, whoop. And Stan goes, yeah, I learned a lesson that night. Steve taught me what one, two was. <laughs> Didn't he yeah. even wrestle for a little bit when he first started as Stan Flair? For some matches. Um, now that I can't answer. I'm, I, I'm I not seem, positive. I seem to recall that there was, because I know that Flair had a little bit to do with it, but I, I know I've got some results where Stan was Flair. Pretty sure. No. Well, it could have been, but there again, that's one thing that I've learned in, in, in doing things, and especially in my life. I mean, you know, at 50 years old, I had an enlightening in life. And I accepted Jesus Christ. And I decided I was never going to lie again. I'm not going to lie again. And and my business comes with a lot of lies. I mean, sure, you know, yeah. you're lying to the public. You're lying about what you're doing. But the only two people I lied to the most was my wife and my mother. And so I said, that's it. I'm not doing it. So if I don't know something or I wasn't an actual eyewitness to it, uh, I won't even half half the time. I won't even comment. I mean, I've got friends that actually do podcasts that they embellish on stories that they act like they were there. I mean, you know, I've been a part of the story and they're telling the story and I'm looking yeah. at them like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I was there. <laughs> that didn't happen. You're, you're telling a story and it's not true. So that was my excuse for all of that. But my idea, my idea is that, you know, it's easy to tell the truth because you don't have to rehearse it or you don't have to remember it. It's always going to be the truth. So, yeah. but now that I'm not employed, I have only two bosses, God and my wife. 
I'm a loose <laughs> cannon. I mean, when Triple H saw me the other night at Royal Rumble, he comes over to me and he hugs me and he said, Steve, Steve, everything's changed here. It's a whole new place. We're going to we're gonna really honor the legends. They gave us a suite with Hogan, all of us in a suite at Royal Rumble. And wow. I'm going, I'm going, you know what? That really sounds great. And I really hope that's true. But I'm not a big trusting person in this business. I mean, you know, yeah. I've been, th I've, I've been through it. I mean, you know, yeah. so yeah. A lot of times it's that Eddie Graham taught me this and I had to pull it on Jerry. Jared, Eddie Graham says, kid, when they put their arm around your shoulder and start patting you on the back, they're most likely taking you to the cliff and getting ready to shove your ass off. <laughs> so, yeah. this is, so this is what you do. When they put his arm around your back, you put your arm up under his arm and hook up over. And I remember Jerry Jarrett, when we really got over as the fabulous ones and we were doing really good business. I mean, it was yeah. a good time. It wasn't yeah. just an individual thing. It was just the right timing for all of that. When we're really doing good business, he come up to me and put his arm around my back, you know, and he's walking me down through the entrance to the Memphis Coliseum. And he's going, you know, Steve, we got a lot of plans for you and all that. And I reached up under him and I hooked my arm back up under his back. And he goes, what are you doing? I said, Jerry, if you're taking me to the cliff, Eddie Graham taught me a long time ago, your ass is going with me. And, and oh, that's he, great. That's you great. You know what? He just busted out laughing and it was almost like, this kid knows too much. Yeah. This guy. Did. <laughs> but I'm a I'm, when I was in the business was a sponge. I just sponged off of everything. Yeah. I wanted to know everything. I mean, you know, Jack Briscoe was my mentor in Harley. Yeah. Both of them taught me watch every match. When you're done with your match, go back out there and watch every match. See who's getting over, how they're getting over, what the crowd likes, what kind of story they're telling. What kind yeah. of movement are they making? And then this is the secret that I taught when I owned the developmental for vets, the FCW. I taught all my students to steal five yeah. things from five people that you admire, that you watched whenever, when you're a kid, now, whatever. Steal one thing from each person that you really like, and you've got you, and it's a proven product. Now, I told him, and this is why I always finish the story with them, at, especially at FCW. I'd say, don't go out there and steal standing in the corner and raising your eyebrow. Sure. That's not a that's not a move. I mean, yeah. you know, and don't and don't try to imitate somebody to perfection because that's a cheap imitation. Yeah. So anyway. Well, you know, it's interesting when you say, it's interesting when you say that steal from others, because. I had actually talked with Vern Gagne about that many, many years ago. And he used to train the guys, different guys through the through the years, you know, like the Anderson brothers and Blackjack Mulligan and Ric Flair and so, so many others. And Vern always said, the thing I need to do once I get these guys in the business, he says, I got to send them on the road. I got to get them to another territory so they can pick up from other boys. They got to learn new holds or learn things that work for them, things that don't work for them. So you're Absolutely. saying the same thing. And and that's that's why I think if you looked at the landscape of professional wrestling in the 70s and the 80s, the early 80s, there were so many wrestlers in all these territories. And a lot of them were Vern Gagne students right. that were making, you know, Ricky Steamboat and Flair, of course. And like I said, the nasty had, boys, the nasty yeah. boys, <laughs> Larry, you know, Larry Hennig earlier, Baron Von Raschke, Kurt Hennig. Uh, just Greg Gagne and I figured out there were over a hundred of them one time that have come wow. out of Vern's camp. So you did your lessons well. And I mean, it showed in your work. Well, here's the thing, George, it wasn't me. It was me listening to people that exactly. had exactly be a sponge and that I admired to yeah. watch Jack, to watch Jack Briscoe wrestle in a one hour Broadway Broadway with anybody, yeah. anybody was yeah. like a wrestling lesson. And and I had the opportunity to wrestle Harley to like four or five one hour Broadways in Florida. It was like wow. going to college. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I admired him so much. It was like really, it made me nervous. I remember the first time I worked with him was in Tampa and we went an hour and 
when we went out there, I mean, you know, I knew Harley, I've been around Harley, but I wasn't on his level. And now all of a sudden I'm on a level for a world title and he's going, okay, kid. And that was back when we used to get our hands checked and our waistline <laughs> checked and the bottom of our boot checked and the referee standing there and he's going, all right, kid, uh, lock up, take a headlock, shoot me off, give me one tackle, drop flat, leapfrog, hip toss me. Um, I'll powder to the floor, follow me out to the floor. We'll round two turn buckles, come back in. You drop flat. I'll hit the ropes. You give me a hip toss. I'll kick out. I'll go to, uh, you go to drop an elbow. I'll move. I'll get up, go to drop elbow. You move. And I'm going, what? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm a nervous wreck. I'm a nervous wreck. And he just called a 10 minute high spot. Yeah. And then, yeah, he, and yeah. he, and then he, then he turns and looks at me. He says, whatever you do. And I'm not going to use the language, but he said, don't yeah. up this. Don't yeah. mess this up. Now, yeah. really, the pressure's on. And I can remember going through it almost like it's yesterday. And as I'm making the movement, I'm going, Oh man, I sure hope I get this right because I know he's left-handed, and whenever I wrestle yeah. guys left-handed, I'm I'm leery because it, you get so used to hit, getting hit with a right hand, sure. and all of a sudden you're sticking your face in front of a left when these guys throw a left. So I go, uh oh, Harley's <laughs> going to knock me out before the bell yeah. rings. Anyway, yeah. Let me ask you a question. When you speak of Harley and Jack Briscoe, I mean, I I I know of them so well, and all right. Guys like that you were in the ring with and often. Were there guys, Steve, that you just wanted to work with? You would every night if you could, in and or were there some that you said, Oh God, I gotta get in with this one? And I, I don't mean you to out anybody really, but that, did you that, have... that was both ways. I mean, yeah. you know, there was guys that here's the thing. When you're a young guy, wrestling First of all, two things. Wrestling is an opinion. Everybody has an opinion on what oh, they sure. think is good and bad. And it's all based on their experiences and what they've witnessed and what they've been kind of controlled, yeah. brainwashed to in their area. The other yeah. side of it is, is when, when you're wrestling guys, there's guys that are generous and there's guys that are going to help you out there. Yeah. Then there's guys that you're that, that are going to really not really do anything to help you they're going to just be all about themselves sure be yeah. because yeah. reality reality about pro wrestling is we're playing a schoolyard game called king on the mountain yeah yeah in that locker room in that arena yeah. with that promoter we're playing king on the mountain and mm -hmm. a lot of guys say we're climbing a ladder well, we're more than climbing a ladder. We're trying to come up a mountain from all kinds of directions to get that main event spot and the largest amount of money. Yeah. So yeah. some of them are on that mountain and they're kicking you down and they're yeah. they're deliberately kicking you down because you're inexperienced, yeah. you're green, and they take advantage of you. Yeah. Then there yeah. was then there was another group that were educators because it with me. At my first five years in the wrestling business, I was considered green. And I did probably 95% jobs, but yeah. I never, I never had a bad face when they said, Oh, you got to get beat. No problem. This is business. I can do it. I'll do the best I can. And when I'd offer, I built a rapport in that dressing room with other people because of Jack and because of Harley, just be generous. Mm -hmm. You're on a learning curve. And I'd say, Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. And yeah. when you were that generous to them, that yeah. automatically made them either like you or take advantage of you. 90% of the time they liked you well enough that that's yeah. basically how my career moved forward by being a guy that was willing to get beat and willing mm -hmm. to do the job and willing mm -hmm. to do it at the best of my ability and make it look like it wasn't, you know, just a slaughter. Yeah. The yeah. other the other side of it was is when it got to be my turn, and all of a sudden they're having to do a job for me. I turned right back around and I treated it the same way because I'd been in that guy's shoes of getting beat yeah. by me. And I yeah. and when they'd say, "Well, you gotta you gotta get beat," and then they'd say, "Well, make it a competition, Steve." So, well, how do you how long you want me to go? I said, "Go thirty minutes." I knew in my heart I could tell a story and make whoever I wrestled with look stronger than when right. they stepped in the ring to begin with because mm -hmm. that he just, I just barely beat him. I didn't just eat him up. 
And, yeah. and, it, and once you got to a certain level, especially being out of Florida or AWA, you were a wrestler. You weren't, you know, like a New York guy or a Tennessee guy. You yeah. could control the match and you could control your opponent. They yeah. had this natural psychology of then they said, where's Kern from? Well, he's from Florida. Boom, a light goes off because they yeah. know how hard it is to break in in this territory. You had mm -hmm. to get beat. I had to get beat up for six months. And I, my dad was a prisoner in Vietnam and I'd come home to my mom and my mom would see my face and she'd go, what, what happened to you? And I go, yeah. these are Matt, these are Matt Burns, mom, on my nose and my ears and uh, my elbows and my knees. And she goes, yeah. honey, she said, honey, I thought wrestling was fake. And I oh, said, mom, man. I said, mom, so did I. <laughs> but, but whatever I'm learning down there at that sportatorium yeah. is real. And it was yeah. a way, it was a way we were educated we yeah. wrestled and sh we would shoot and I couldn't shoot. I'm not a shooter, so I don't ever claim to be, but you had to shoot with hero Matsuda and Jack oh, and Bob yeah. Roof. And Bob yeah. Roof, Bob Roof, I was going to say would be a tough one. Oh, and, and, and they didn't, nobody ever, ever punched me right in my teeth and my face, but they punished me. And mm -hmm. what it taught me was how to respect my business. Right. Eddie, yeah. Eddie Graham had a law in this territory if you're ever in a bar and somebody oh, yeah. confronts you about reality and wrestling, you better win that fight or get a U-Haul. Yeah. He said, because you better fight number one for your business. And then yeah. if you lose, if you lose, you better get a U-Haul. And yeah. so that, that was wow. the rule. Yeah. That's so interesting. You say that because again, I know Vern Gagne and Eddie Graham were good friends uh -huh. and they, I know they talked often and they exchanged talent from time to time. And that very thing you just said, Vern always told the guys, he said, you go out, you get in a fight, you better win it. Because if you, you don't, win. don't come back to the office. Said, <laughs> You're yeah. no longer here. Yeah, because then everybody in town is going to know he beat up yeah. a wrestler. Yeah. Uh, I, used to, uh, I used to outsmart them, though. I kind of like, got, I got so good in the bars. I mean, you know. I learned the psychology of just having a dominant character. And when, when somebody approached me, because I, I, um, Don Curtis taught me to sleeper hole. And when you had a hold oh, here yeah. in Florida, and when you had a hold here in Florida, you had to shoot with the hole. So I learned the yeah. shooting sleeper hole. And Eddie would have me do, um, ha uh, at intermission, he'd have volunteers out of the audience come up in the audience and wanted to see, that wanted to be go put through the sleeper hole. <laughs> and it was, and it, and I'd be nervous because I'm going, well, I, I've done it every time, no problem. But what about one time? And I never, it never happened. But, yeah. you know, with those kind of things, when it comes time to the fight, I mean, you know, some uh, example, we have a little part of Tampa called Ebor City. It's kind of all bars and a rough little bit of an area. And, and me and Dusty would go in there real late at night. And a guy pulls up with, beside me at a bar and just leans into me and goes, wait. Well, hey, what do you think about a karate guy against a wrestler? And I'm looking at the guy, right? And I'm going, are you talking about me and you? And the guy says, I just asked you a question. And immediately I was went from Mr. Nice Guy to a real dominating force. And, you know, when you rush somebody and get right up in their face, and yeah. say, let's, let's go right now. It just kind of puts that doubt in their mind as well, wrestling may not be real, but this guy's pretty sure of himself. So, like I said, I wasn't a shooter, but I right. grew up in a rough, I grew up in a rough area. Myself, Hulk Hogan, Mike Graham, Dick Slater, yeah. Austin, Austin Idol, we all went to high school together. Was Kevin all, Sullivan part of that too? No, but Kevin nope. Sullivan came into the territory early in our yeah. careers and was Mike Graham's first partner. Right. Okay. Well, Kevin's a tough. Kevin's yeah. double tough. I've seen Kevin beat up a lot of people. And I, I didn't even know he was that tough. One time he scared me. And I said, he pulled the guy's nose and ripped the nose off. And I'm going, oh, my God. Oh. I, 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 I said, <laughs> he says, well, he was like from Boston. And he says, yeah, I'm your Dick Slater from Boston. <laughs>
I want I want to share a quick story with you about your your buddy Harley Race when you talk about okay. being tough. In 1964, 1965 in February, uh, Harley was pretty young. He was just twenty something at the time, and right. he had went to he had went to a bar after the the wrestling card in Minneapolis. He had went to a, a place called the Chestnut Tree. It was a hangout here in Minneapolis downtown, and there were three guys beating up on a lady in the bar. Now I don't know if the lady was a stripper or what the deal was, but there were three guys pounded on. The manager of the strip of the uh, chestnut tree came to Harley and asked if he could intervene. He knew he was a wrestler. Harley went up, and this is a true story. It made the newspapers. Harley got up. He took out two of the guys. I mean, he popped them, knocked them down. Another guy came up behind him, the third guy, and he got Harley in the back. Uh, it was on the right-hand side. Got him in the back with a knife. And Harley went down, went to the hospital. He's out of action legitimately for, you know, about four weeks, three, three four weeks. Um, the, the, the moral of the story is, is that Harley was a heel. He was handsome Harley Race in those days, teamed with pretty boy Larry Hennig. So right. they had well, heat a, like you would. There's another tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They had heat like you wouldn't believe, you know, because they, they were face of the, the face of Hercules or mind of Einstein and the body of Hercules and all that crap they threw out so he's he's in the hospital and it made the minneapolis paper st paul papers and i have the clippings he he comes back after his injury and the very first night on tv he was introduced the tv audience 100 people whatever they had they cheered like you wouldn't believe harley race the bell rang harley went in first in the tag match and i kid you not Within 10 seconds, that entire audience was booing Harley Race again. Yep. <laughs> and Harley said later, he said, I had to get my heat back. I couldn't let that crowd think I'm I'm a good guy. But Harley, Harley was not a baby face. He and he had, that, he had baby. that scar for the rest of his life. It was a moon-shaped scar on the back, and it stayed with him the rest of his life. Well, I had a lot of real experiences with Harley in Atlanta. He had me come in and um, he had me and Ricky Gibson and somebody else come down and shoot with some marks. And I saw him there chase a guy out the building and right out right into the street and broke his arm right in front of me. But here's the here's the one that really got me about Harley and I wasn't there. It's when the, they were going to rob that restaurant. I don't know if you ever heard that story. But Harley was in a restaurant and a guy, uh, two guys come in to rob the place and they went around to all the people sitting at tables and they were saying, give me your watch, give me your ring, give me your wallet, give me your wife's diamond ring. And they got to Harley and the, guy, one, the one guy was at the door watching the door and the guy got to Harley and he said, give me your watch. And Harley said, no. Nah. And then he told him, give him his ring. No. Nah. And then he told him, give me your wallet. No. Nah. And the guy says, you give it to me, I'm going to shoot you. He said, you're not going to have a chance. And Harley hooked that gun, rammed that guy, and run him right into the other guy out through the door and beat the shit out of both of them, and they both got arrested. I think that was in St. Joe, Missouri. Yeah. Same kind of thing happened with Mr. Wow. Saito. Mr. Yeah. Saito was in a restaurant, minding his own business, and somebody came up from behind to rob that place, and it was <laughs> It was a Japanese or a Chinese restaurant in, in, in California, and they went to rob it, and Saito's right there, and they pushed him out of the way. And you never, Mr. Saito was a cool guy, but you don't push him. And when, right. they, when the guy pushed him, he saw the gun, he knocked the gun down and suplexed the guy, and he became a big hero, and he was a heel too. Sure. And, you yeah. know, so there's a couple of those stories that, you know, stuck out in my mind that I wasn't an eyewitness to, but I yeah. heard him a hundred times and I actually heard Harley. Harley actually told me the story about the restaurant. I mean, he used a little bit different language than I'm using, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. he, he, he emphasized words when he would say, yeah. Yeah. not my wallet, not my wallet. <laughs> I mean, you know, not my wife. My wife's not going to give you her ring either. <laughs> so well, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say that if they were in a fight, they'd want Harley to have their back. You know, I mean, he was le he he was legit tough. He just he didn't know yeah. fear. Yeah, I have yeah. a couple. I have a couple of those guys. Um, Haku, um, yeah, 
he's yeah. real close, close friend of mine. What I was smart enough to do, and you know, this is just psychology. I wasn't a shooter, but I was best friends with all of them. And I mean, I was close to all of them and I would do anything for them. They're my brothers and I love them. Yeah. But if you were really to do something to Steve Kern, you're going to be answering to some seriously tough guys in the wrestling business because that they wouldn't appreciate that. And even yeah. the road warriors, the night I double crossed them there in Minneapolis, when we came to the ring and Billy Robinson and Kurt, Kurt's dad, Larry, the ax. And I mean, you know, Brad Rangans and all of them are telling them, don't mess with the fabs. And I mean, you know, it's like I made a lot of really good friends and it, it really boils down to being humble. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things that I teach and I've taught more people in wrestling than anybody in history because that I ran the developmental and then ran school since 81. And what I always teach is, is it's a simple thing. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Yeah. And you want to, and you want to get along in that dressing room. Don't yeah. come in with a cocky, arrogant attitude thinking that that's going to get over because yeah. there's a lot of people in that dressing room that you're going you're gonna to find out that are tougher than you, and they don't want that. Come yeah. in with an attitude of, man, what did your mom teach you? Just treat people the way you want to be treated. And I was mm -hmm. always a humble guy. I mean, when the night, um, we first night we showed up in Minneapolis, I remember opening the dressing room door and I jerked it quick, real quick back. And I looked at Stan, I said, uh-oh. And Stan was nervous with me because <laughs> of my history, right? And he goes, what? And I said, I've ribbed every one of those guys oh, in there no. when they came to Florida, especially Billy Robinson. And they're yeah. all shooters. And he goes, great. <laughs> I, said, I, got, I, I said, don't worry, I got this. So when we walked back in the dressing room, it was funny because when they stood up, there was some kind of some stiff looks because I, I mean, I, I really ribbed some serious ribs with alligators and stuff down here in Florida. But I dropped to my knees in front of all of them and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to rib you when they came to Florida. It was just so easy. It's all my fault, I swear. <laughs> You can do anything. I'll get you a hot dog. I said, I'll, I'll go buy anything you want anytime we're working. I mean, you know, Stan will give you all of his girlfriends. I said, you know, <laughs> and all of them started laughing. But then they all started telling the ribs that I'd pulled on sure. them, you know, and that's so, all. Yeah. Uh, I wanted ask to ask you. you oh, go ahead, Brian. Go. Thanks. Uh, Steve, I wanted to ask you, I've watched some of those matches with you and Stan against the Road Warriors. Uh -huh. Even when you were when you were baby faces and when uh, there was a match in particular, I remember in Winnipeg, you all did with the Road Warriors. You were the heel team for there. Were they, I mean, it looked like they were really pounding you guys and vice versa. Was it, was there really heat between all four of you guys or was it just... Mm -hmm. The no, doing your abs <clears throat> absolutely not. It was a very professional environment. Okay. I, I <clears throat> where I'm from and my style is I'm a stiff worker. Okay. I believe, I believe, especially two moves. If I slap you, you better have your mouth shut because I'm going to slap the crap out of you. If I chop you, I'm going to put my hand, hit you so hard, I'm going to leave print on your back because those okay. two moves are not damaging. But I was taught in my history in wrestling, like I said earlier about wrestling has opinions, I was taught in my education that the audience has come to go on a ride and they want to be told a story and they want to leave their life behind and get caught up in a story of good versus evil. And they want it to be believable. They don't yeah. want to see a bunch of hokey stuff where you're barely touching each other. Yeah. I mean, we laid it in. And it, but yeah. the thing is, is you got to remember the whole scenario is, is when you walk out in your underwear in front of thousands and thousands of people, <laughs> your yeah. level of intensity goes up like 99%. And the yeah. feeling you get, you feel no pain. I mean, yeah. you feel no pain. I mean, you know, there's a sudden jolt when you break something and you realize yeah. you can't get up. But yeah. other than that, now the next day is another story. 
But yeah. I mean, I mean, Hawk and, and Joe, Joe wasn't as stiff as Hawk. Hawk really yeah. liked to go at it. But I yeah. think it was more he was green than he, I mean, you know, because it, when, you know, I, I, I witnessed it the very first time we wrestled in Memphis, you know, where I grabbed an arm on Hawk. And when I took his arm, he's got his arm stuck out. I'm twisting it. And he's just looking at me and he's going, ah! he's not selling nothing. I mean, so I go, well, you're not going to sell your arm. It's a big arm. I get it and all that. I'm taking you down. And I took him down and I worked his leg. Well, when you're on your back, and I don't care how big you are, you can't be that strong because the guy keeps taking your legs out from under you and keeps yeah. working them, then you have to react to it. So yeah. Hawk would get mad at me because that he knew that I could outsmart him when he wasn't selling his arm or a, a headlock was like a waste of movement. But at the same time, he, he gained respect for me because he said, well, one thing about Kern, He's smart enough to know how to make me sell. He'll take me down. And I and I said, I yeah. don't want to do that. I don't want, I yeah. really don't want to do that. I would rather work standing up, but I saw it. I mean, you know, Stan and I were pretty jacked. I mean, you know, we got pretty big yeah. um, being influenced by them. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we got, got to where we could hold our own. So it wasn't like they mm. were doing... The only thing like Bobby Heenan was was really, really loved us. But he had Nick Bockwinkle and Mr. Saido. And yeah. Nick Bockwinkle would, would say things like, ah, oh, these guys look like two guys that fell off of a cake in San Francisco, a couple of gay guys, you know. And, and Bobby Heenan says, you know what? That's pretty funny now, Nick. But I understand Kern's a big river. I mean, you know, keep it up. Keep it up, you know. So no, I never ribbed Nick. Yeah, you know, I had respect I was, for him. No, I was just gonna say, you guys, when your matches, because I want, I remember him as a kid. You know, I was a teenager in the '80s, and I just remember they look so real, which is good. That's what your job. Which is good. You want real, but it looks so real. Like you guys really did not like each other. Did not. You were in there to do a job, yes, but you guys really. You did it great because it was so believable to me. I mean, I was a teenager. I believed you guys, you know, and your other matches you had um, with those guys, you know, it, Long Riders, all those guys in the AWA in 84, uh, 85. Working, working with Bruiser Brody was a, like a night off for me, but working with Nick was a little hard because Nick was a loose worker. Yeah. And he didn't like me. I mean, he didn't like to feel me. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I get it. And and yeah. George asked a question earlier, was there guys you like to work with, didn't like to work with? Well, it was better to ask somebody else because there was a lot of guys that didn't want to work with me. Um, Honky Tonk Man, Wayne Ferris. I remember the first time I wrestled him in Tennessee when we got done, he came in the back. He said, do I owe you money? And I go, what? <laughs> he go, I go, what? And he said, Man, you beat the hell out of me out there. I said, brother, my job is to make it look real. Um, you know, the way I was yeah. taught, you guys can all make it look however you want to. And if, if you're not trying to get hurt, I get it. I'm not worried about getting hurt. I'm trying to protect my industry and my business. I want yeah. there to be the slightest doubt in somebody's mind when I get out of that ring and walk back to them people. Do you yeah. really want to jump that guy or not? I mean, yeah. you know, in Chicago, one time the lights went off and we were being introduced. And me and Stan come out of the tunnel there at the Rosemont Horizon. And we're working against the Road Warriors in there in the ring already. And they hailed from Chicago, even though they weren't from Chicago. They always right. said, said there. And so they're over like Rover. And when we come through there, the tunnel, the light hit me and Stan in the face. And three guys jumped the fence right there. Oh, come no. at it and attacked us. Well, I, you know, in, in the light, I can't see, but nobody ever touched me. But the spotlight went off, and I'm looking right at this. And them Chicago cops right there, they beat the hell out of these three guys in the dark. <laughs> and I mean, just beat them with billy clubs. And when the lights come on, there's me and Stan standing there, and three guys laying on the floor. 
and cops are hooking up their ankles to handcuffs and dragging them down the ramp. And all of a sudden, we get the biggest pop ever. It's like, oh, man, these guys are kind of fruity looking, but they just kicked the <laughs> shit out of three guys. Come. <laughs> wrestling fans, promoters, wrestlers, and anyone who enjoys pro wrestling now have something new to be excited about. The Wrestling Fans International Association, the WFIA, is back. WFIA is an association that exists to promote, grow, and support professional wrestling throughout the world. Membership is free. Your membership includes a free digital bi-monthly publication of the Wrestling Fan News newsletter, association updates, voting privileges, and much more. Please go to thewfia.org, that's T-H-E-W-F-I-A.org, and become a member today. Did you ever wonder what could have been with the AWA had things gone differently? Had their fortunes gone differently? Had certain wrestlers not left and perhaps more money would have been at the disposal of the Ganyas? Well, wonder no further. You can go to Brad Drake's YouTube channel and experience the 1987 Supermod for yourself. As Brad Drake starts off in May 1987, along with Greg Ganya, Baron Von Rotschke, Vern Ganya himself, Nick Bockwinkle, Larry Zabisco, Kurt Hennig, and a slew of others as he plays and saves the AWA. Hello everyone, this is Brian Ferguson, the host of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I want to tell you about a new podcast out called Fouls Count Anywhere. It is a classic pro wrestling podcast that brings you the legends of wrestling with true wrestling fans Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. They bring on guests that are legends in this business, as well as wrestlers of today, promoters, referees, you name it. They have them on there, folks. And I encourage you to listen to them. If you're on YouTube, watch them. They drop every Saturday. They have their podcast. They drop it in the afternoon. So look forward to that podcast coming out. Falls Count Anywhere podcast with Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. Folks, you will not be disappointed. I guarantee it. And enjoy the podcast. Steve, I was going to ask you, when when you, I think you came in in Memphis before that. Yes, sir. Right? Um, when you came into Vern and in 84, mm-hmm. what, 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 was the, what was promised you or told of you what they expected of you, what they were going to do with you? Was it intended that you might get the tag title? How, how was that working? Because the reason I ask is it seemed like just from an observer standpoint at that time period, that you were getting the huge push, but it seemed to shift a little bit when the Warriors came in, the Road Warriors. Well, you, you, here's the first thing, George. You really never know when the powers of control are doing. Yeah. And, and even if they tell you they're doing something, you can believe right. probably 60% of it, you know, and then... I mean, you know, not to say they're all going to be lying to you, but they're trying to keep you there. That's the first thing. And they need opponents and stuff like that. And nobody really made us promises of belts or things like that because it, to me, I got to be perfectly honest. I mean, I held over 50 titles. I'm the Florida heavyweight t- uh, champion five times, and I'm the NWA world junior heavyweight champion. Those are things that aren't really my merit. I didn't win that stuff. Yep. I was given. I was given that stuff. I was told to win that night. I was told to lose when I lost it. So I never. I never really gave much effort. I mean, you know, much merit on belts. My thing was my check. <laughs> bo- bo- bottom line. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, people say, "Well, were you in it just for the money?" Absolutely not. I mean, it was a very thrilling life. And I mean, you know, I met a lot of unbelievable, they call them marks now, but I still call them fans. And I, I kind of feel a like mark thing is an insult. They don't know it, but to me, I'm, I'm insulting them because that was behind the scene terms that we use. Yeah. Can you hear my killer dog? He's blind. He's in there barking and there's nobody there. I don't know, but you have to put up with me. He's a little miniature dachshund. No problem. He's deaf too, or I'd tell him to shut up so it's not going to do any good. <laughs> but belts have no meaning. I mean, you know, all of the, everything that does to, to, to do with wrestling is fabricated. I mean, yeah. 
I've got friends, the nasty boys we just mentioned a minute ago. Nobs lives here, and Sags lives here in Tampa. Well, there's there's 50 of us that live in this Tampa Bay area of guys, all generations. And Nobs, I talked to Nobs the other day, and his heart is broken that they haven't put him in the Hall of Fame yet. And he's going, man, he says, before I die, I just want to be in the Hall of Fame. And he's crying on my shoulder. And see, I babysat those guys when nobody would take them. I brought them to Florida and we used them. But I said to Noms, I said, Noms, this ain't real. (laughs) I mean, you know, this is not real. You're worried about a Hall of Fame. There's about 10 Hall of Fame. But the other side of it is, if this was baseball and you had hit 9 million home runs and you'd caught about 400,000 flies and you didn't get put in the Hall of Fame, I get it. But yeah. everything that happened in this industry, no matter what it was, no matter what the belt was, I mean, when I did Skinner in the WWF, Alligator Poacher out of the Everglades, that was one of my favorite characters. And people say, well, you know, they never did nothing with Skinner, you know? And I go, well, that's not my fault, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm a homophobic, and they found out Pat Patterson when he knew I was coming into the territory. I mean, you know, there was a big clash right away. And so, I mean, you know, I didn't see any big plans. It went back to this. What are you going to pay me? I don't yeah. care if you beat me. I don't care if I ever wear a title. If if that's what I'm going to be remembered as, that, okay, well, you didn't do that good, or you, you're not in the Hall of Fame. I'm going, wait a minute. You're talking to a guy that trained the Bella twins, the Mm -hmm. Bella twins, two skinny little girls Mm -hmm. that came from modeling to me and Tom Pritchard at FCW. We taught them. They went up to WWE. Next thing I know, they're being inducted in the Hall of Fame. So do you think that that's going to hurt my feelings? No, absolutely not, because I'm a realist. I get it. It's about drawing money, selling tickets, Hall of Fame, whatever it is, political, who knows? But Nimes is just like, it's killing him. It's killing yeah. him that they're not putting him in the Hall of Fame. And I said, I told him, I said, well, maybe he was friends with Shawn Michaels quite a bit. And Shawn Michaels was really tight with Triple H. And I, I mean, we were just at Royal Rumble. And I, Triple H was in such a, you know, kind of a different mode now that Vince was at like towering over him. That, you know, maybe now they'll loosen up a little bit and they'll think about some of you guys. I mean, you know, and I would really love to see them go in the Hall of Fame. But yeah. but I know how much they pay and it's not it's not that big a deal. If they yeah. gave you 50, 50 grand in a Super Bowl ring, I'd be really crying the blues to you guys right now. Why am I not in the Hall of Fame? But that's not a big payoff. They give you a ring. and I mean, it's, it's a great honor. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not knocking yeah. the whole thing. But, you know, Vince took this whole country and the world to another level on smartening everybody up. Right. But inevitably, he didn't smarten all the boys up. I mean, you know, to yeah. this day, to this day, guys will say, well, you know, uh, well, I beat you over there. Go, Wait a minute. You didn't beat me. <laughs> Dusty was the booker. Dusty, yeah. uh, Dust, Dusty beat me, you know, so... Yeah, yeah. I, I like your comment about getting paid because I that is the bottom line. You can make a great living in a certain territory and you could be in the mid card or be the be the jobber every week. So you made good money. Nick Bockwinkle, you know him. And he came up with a perfect way to put that comment. He said one time he went into a territory and the promoter told him that he was going to he didn't want to have Nick Bockwinkle there. He was going to call. He says, is it OK if I call you Roy Diamond? And Nick responded, and he loved telling this story. He said, I responded to him, I don't care if you bill me as asshole, just pay me. <laughs> and Nick that was, was the exact a, term. Nick was a smart guy. I worked my last 14 years under Vince's thumb. A lot of people don't like Vince. Um, and I'm not a big fan of Vince's either. But he was my boss. Yep, and this yep. is this is what I gotta say at the end of the 14 years, seven as an agent and seven running FCW. What I gotta say is I put two kids through college. There my my son is a doctor. He has no student loans. My daughter is in IT and really high up on a ladder for her education. I paid for all of this stuff. I paid it because that I got paid by Vince McMahon and the WWE. Yep. So 
do I like, I wouldn't want to hang out with Vince. We never hung out or he didn't come over to my house and swim in the pool or nothing, you know, but do I, you, do I respect? Yeah. Because it, you know, it, it just what you said, George, the guy paid me so well. Um, I'm doing my second book now, which is a continuation. It, uh, my life went from my beginning of my life to 1987, the end of the fabulous ones. The second one picks up in 87. It goes through all the WWE, WWF, all of the, you know, just tours right. and the whole thing. Then the FCW of training, all the talent that there is now. I mean, everybody that's in WWE went through FCW originally. And when you look at all of that stuff, you go, wait a minute. Vince, Vince set this whole thing up. I mean, you know, I worked hard. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, he, he got his money's worth. And I mean, you know, he had me under so much pressure as an agent that, you know, the business was no longer fun to me. I mean, yeah. when you're a wrestler, it's fun because you're only responsible for that time you're in the ring and what happens. And it, get it over and you're out of there. You're in the dressing room, you're in the ring, you're done, and now you're on the road. So that was it. It was a lot of fun. But when you're an agent, I mean, you're writing the report. You're running the show. You're counting the building. You're reporting to the office. You're doing everything. You start at three in the afternoon and don't shut down till one o'clock in the morning. And then you oh, get on wow. a plane and then you're running it again. And if you were like me, a lot of times I ran European tours and, and foreign tours like the Philippines and stuff. Now you're a babysitter. Now oh, yeah. you're, baby, you're babysitting the talent because guess who's responsible is let's just say Randy Orton gets in trouble in Manila. Okay, well, who are they going to turn to first? Well, who's the agent? Turn. Get Kern on the phone. What are you doing letting the guy go out and get drunk? Like, I'm going to follow him? I mean, do I need to follow everybody? But I took yeah. the responsibility and I got cussed real bad one time when I was calling a match at, um, I don't know if it was WrestleMania or Raw, but the talent got so nervous, they started forgetting spots. And I'm calling it on a headset, staying two moves ahead of them for camera angles. And all of a sudden, they just take a left turn and they're nowhere near where I'm talking. And Vince looks over at me and, he, and he's got a headset on and this monitor and he moves it out of the way. And he goes, hey, Steve, what the hell are they doing? And I look at him, man, and I got no answer. I just looked at him and says, I don't know. And he's, when the end of the match came, he didn't wait for them to come through that curtain. He got up from that seat and he said, step up. And I got up and I went around in front of the monitors and he got right here in my face and he cussed me like a dog. I mean, he, oh cussed, me to the, he cussed me to the point that I was actually contemplating headbutting him. Then I started thinking about giving him a nut shot. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> All of a sudden, I had a reality thing. And I said, this is the guy that's writing my check. Yep, exactly. And, yeah. and, then, and then I said this. I said to him, I said, you're absolutely right, Vince. It's 100% my fault. I'm going to do whatever I can to never let that happen again. Then he looked at me like a puppy. And he turned his head sideways and this way and looked at me. He goes, all you need to say, Steve. And he went and sat down. It was over for him, but I was in shell shock. When I got in the car with Arn Anderson and Dean Malenko and Fit Finley, the agents, the leave. First thing Arn always said when we got in the car, that every night he'd turn around and go, okay, who got cussed tonight? <laughs> and, I go, and, and I said, I did. And, and um, Jerry Briscoe had said, man, he really cussed you out. <laughs> oh, and so... I never had an experience like that, but I never held any of that against him because he's running a major company. And, and when we were there, when I was there in 91 as Skinner, everybody in the territory were top guys from all the regionalized territories. Yeah. I'd be on the, I'd be on the first match with Ricky Steamboat or Kerry Von Erich or the second or the third match, you know, I mean, it yeah. was no pecking order there except for Hogan you know, yeah. and the top guys, which was great because the houses were great. But, you know, it's like you just kind of accept things, you know, and yeah. yeah. What are you gonna well, say? you give such a great example. And unfortunately, a lot of guys didn't do that. Well, you, yeah. you had, the, there's you had a lot of guys that, that aren't at peace. That. There's a lot of guys that aren't at peace. Right. Yeah. Because right. I do these, I do these autograph signings. And when I sit down, they're either talking to me about 
sickness, injury, or being screwed over in a business and not getting a fair shake. Right. And I'm looking and I'm looking at him and going, you know, don't you know no jokes? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear none of that. I don't want to hear nothing about anybody. And I'm going to pray for you if you're having problems, of course. And that's my yeah. deal. And yeah. and it's hard to be a serious Christian because that you're always having a finger pointed at you and you're persecuted for righteousness. But my thing I is... I can relate to that. I'm, I, I read the Bible and I've read it 21 times. I read every day. And here's the thing, twice, in Matthew and in Luke, Jesus says, acknowledge me publicly and I will acknowledge you before my father. I'm serious about what I do. So I never, yeah. I never back off. I mean, you know, and there's a lot of people that aren't Christians in this business and I don't, it's not like I can control that, right. but that doesn't mean I'm going to shut up either. So, right. you know, and I'm just as guilty. I mean, you know, my past, um, I got a pastor that said it the best. He says, it's not where your heels have been. It's where your toes are pointed. And that's a good one oh, for me. <laughs> that is good. good. Yeah. Yeah. That's because where analogy. my, where my heels have been, my friends are skeptical when I do eulogies and stuff at funerals and they go, wow, I didn't know you were so religious. And they go, what happened? You know, <laughs> I said, well, I woke up. I woke up to a lot of things. I woke up to realizing all the miracles I'd seen in my life and how my life was so yeah. blessed by traveling the world. I've been mm. around the world so many times and it's not braggadocious. It's, it was a, it was a gift from God to show me everything and to open yeah. everything up to me. I, I'm not the most educated guy. Um, school wise. When I started college, they asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, what makes the most money? And they go, well, do doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. I mean, you know, so I wasn't an Indian. So I said, I'm going to be, a, I said, I'm going to be a doctor. And I've signed up for pre-med. Well, you know, you have to have prerequisites when you go to college for pre-med. You need to know something before you get there. And every course I signed up for, they'd say, get your slide rule out or get your lab coat or get your microscope. And I'd just say, well, there's another class I'm quitting. And then when it came down to Eddie Graham breaking me into the business, he said, well, what do you want to do now? Because he was being my father, my dad being a prisoner of war. He was a prisoner of war from the time I was 13 to 21. So Eddie was a surrogate wow. father that fit in. And Eddie Eddie would say, well, now what are you going to do? You didn't want to be a wrestler. I go, uh, I guess I've changed my mind. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, wow, that's that's amazing. You know. I really, we really appreciate you coming on tonight, Steve, uh, all your insight and experience. I've really enjoyed it. You're so humble and you're so real. That's what I really enjoy the most is you call it like it is. You don't sugarcoat, but you're real and you're honest. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. I, I I'd like to leave the door open for you to come again sometime, be a yeah. guest again. and. Run. You know, I got, I've got nothing but time. I got five of the most beautiful grandkids in the world. I'm blessed. I got one child with beautiful. three grandkids living one yeah. mile one way, and I've got my son living two miles the other way. There you go. Two, two, two kids. I mean, you know, my grandson just left. I, I didn't have the opportunity to spend as much time with my children as they grew up, mm -hmm. but I did do a lot of family things like vacations and stuff with them. But I vowed to be the best, best, grandpa. best, best grandpa ever. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm kind of stiff at times because it, I believe in manners. I believe yeah. in, in being polite. I believe mm -hmm. in yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Please. Thank you. May yeah. I don't go in the refrigerator. I mean, you know, take your hat off <laughs> when you're at the dinner table. We're going to say yeah. the blessing. So, but they don't call me grandpa. They call me big daddy. And I mean, you know, so ah, I, have, I love it. I have, uh, yeah. Uh, before we go, I did want to show you this book here too. This okay. book is a, another one that Ian Douglas wrote. It's called Bohemian Rhapsody. Of course, he wrote my book and he wrote five other wrestlers books. But the yeah. reason I wanted to show you this is because that anybody that's watching and you've got wrestling fans watching, anybody that watches and really loves wrestling history, 
people yeah. never got to got to witness the wrestling in the Bahamas. And there's 700 islands in the Bahamas. And I did because I'm a Florida boy and I wrestled there a lot of times. I actually wrote the foreword to his book. But okay. Ian really Ian really captures the history and one of the big stars, Kevin Sullivan, Dusty Rhodes. I mean, you know, the, it's endless of who went through the Bahamas. Yeah. What a what a di different atmosphere that was only being 60 miles off of our coast right here of way yeah. the wrestling fans acted. I mean, the cops had bamboo sticks that <laughs> was like a wand and a wow. little helmet. And the people, I've seen them riot so bad. They're throwing chairs like Frisbees and the cops are just waving the little fans. But the actually arena that we wrestled in in Nassau was nothing but a concrete building, 12 feet high, square, and on the top had chicken wire clear across the top. And it wow. was because people would stand on the outside and lob rocks and bottles oh and all kinds wow. of stuff. It was a wild place, but it's a very interesting read, you know. So, okay. of course, my, my book's better, but his is Yeah, good. right. Yeah. Is, is he well, working on your second book with you as well? I don't have it. I haven't, I haven't put it out yet. I'm right now. We're going over um, rough draft. I okay. have with my writer. He I dictate to him for two hours a week, and then he writes stuff down. And we already okay. had completed it, and we haven't put the pictures in it because I really love pictures and wrestling history. Yeah. And I've got I've got great pictures that people never seen. And the other thing is is until it comes out, I'm just you know it is coming out. But mm -hmm. this one, this one that you read now, it everybody that's read it, including all my friends, and they said, "Man, that's an easy reading. It's just like you just kind of get into it, yeah. And you know, learning about something, and then you just kind of flows. and And even I read it. I mean, you know, and I the only book I read <laughs> is the Bible, and I read my yeah. whole book. I mean, you know, so. But I'm yeah. I'm actually I'm actually in the final draft editing on it. Okay, and, great. And and I, I you know what's happening? I I be you know right up front with this is I'm, I kind of I don't want to leave nothing out. Yeah. And when yeah. you when you spend forty four years of your life full time in an industry, there's yeah. a lot. And then yeah. all of a sudden, like I get knobs or somebody call me up and says, man, tell them about that rib when you rib me, when you painted on my back on Valentine's Day. Or, and then <laughs> tell, them about, tell them about when we're at Stephen King's house and I pushed you down the hill on a slide. I'm going like, I'm like, a t you know, but people want to hear. Yeah, all right. this, Maybe you yeah. have to have a third book. I, well, yeah. <laughs> this one is going to be That's interesting it. to you guys in AWA. Yeah, because I pull I pull my greatest rib in my history on Kurt awesome. Henning. Oh, I have, I, and I he's a river, but he yeah. wouldn't mess with me because we were best <laughs> friends. And I had him arrested for statutory rape, getting off an airplane in Memphis oh. by about a by about a six foot five, four hundred and fifty five pound redneck cop with an attitude. Oh, and when wow. Kurt when Kurt got off the plane, we could walk out to the run. I mean, we could go out to the terminal at that time. Sure. And I snuck out there and was hiding behind a pole. And Kurt come off the plane all bouncing around in Memphis. And top goes up to him and said, you Kurt Henning? And Kurt goes, yes, sir. And he sticks out his hand to shake his hand like he was a fan. And the guy says, I don't want to shake your hand, boy. You're under arrest. And Kurt's Whoa. going, what? And he goes... <laughs> What for? And he says, well, read the warrant. And so Kurt started reading it. I'm looking at it. It's statutory rape. And it's oh my because God. Of, and it's a dad that swore out the warrant. I mean, I filled out the warrant. I even signed the part <laughs> with a judge. Oh I mean, the, co the, the cops in Memphis were really close with the fabulous ones, and they were so much fun. They would, I had more guys arrested for stuff. But <laughs> Kurt, when he's reading it, he goes, I've never even been to Memphis. And the cop says, the cop says real straight, he says, I never arrested anybody as innocent either. You got two ways to leave this airport. <laughs> either either you turn around, I'll handcuff you, we'll go get your bag and get in the car, or you refuse to turn around, and I'll beat your phony wrestling ass down and drag you through this airport. And Kurt just oh, looked man. at him, you know, what are you going to say? And Kurt <laughs> wow. just let's go. And I, but you have to read the book to hear the well, film. We're going to read awesome. it. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I want to read it because I told John I was on board with you from when you started in the business and right up yeah. to the end. So I, well, mine's I hope, coming. Amazon's going to be delivering it in I, a couple I, days. I yeah. hope you enjoy it, George. I, I will. Enjoy. I, I really appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys having yeah. me on too. You're doing Thank a great you. show and. Yeah, and I'll so see you. In, I'll see you in St. Louis in May. Okay, I'm looking forward right. to it. Yeah, well, I'm not really looking forward to St. Louis, but I'm looking forward to going. I mean, you know, well, I'm looking forward to meeting you in St. Louis. You, That's well, I'll right. look forward to meeting you too. All right, man. all right. Thank you so ladies much, and, Steve. It's been great. Thanks, okay. ladies and gentlemen. That, one more time, Steve Kerr, the fabulous okay. one, Skinner. One, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate one thing it. I want. One thing yep. I want to say. Are you still? Am I you still bet. on? Yes, this sir. Is Gordon, this is what I grew up with. Gordon Soley used to end his show the same way every time, and this was his tagline: "So long from the Sunshine State." There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Folks, thank if you're you watching, guys. thank you. If you're listening, thank you. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. We'll talk to you soon.